Well, good morning, staff, for crossing. Will you stand with us? We are going to enter his courts with thanksgiving and his place with praise. So sing with us again this morning, join with Laura, as we sing out these words from Psalm 100. Oh, 
about his, his glory. Please have a seat. Well, good morning to you. My name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here. I just want to welcome you all to our uh, worship service, those here in person, as well as those of you joining us online, wherever you may be. Uh, We're so glad that we can be together and we can worship our God together, whether we're in the same room or scattered abroad. Uh, It's a wonderful thing. Uh, And I want to direct all of our attention to the digital bulletin. It's got all the information that's going on in the life of our church, events that are coming up. I'll highlight just a few in a minute. Uh, But it's also the digital bulletin is a way to communicate with the church. Uh, Maybe there's some prayer needs in your life, things that you're going through or worried about, questions you may have, and you could submit those, that information to us. It's also uh, on the tear-off card of the sermon notes that you were given on the way in, if you're here in person, and you can communicate with us that way as well. Special guest or a special welcome to any guests with us this morning, online or in person. Uh, and if you're new with us and, and we've never formally met you, we'd love to say hello and know your name and, and you know introduce our names and uh, and just begin to know each other that way. And we invite you to to make yourself known to us. Again, you can do that through the digital bulletin or the tear off card. If you're here in person, you can take that card to the uh, information counter at the end of the service. We've got a little gift for you, and we'd love to just say hello. Uh, a couple events. That, you'll need, that we want you to know about coming up in the life of the church. One on July 23rd is uh, Summer Splash, which is a great event for families, especially families with elementary and younger kids. We've got in, big inflatables here and free food and games to play and, you know, uh, amazing priceless prizes to win at those games. It's incredible. Um, And so it's a great opportunity, one, to really uh, just have fun as a family, to be a part of this church family, but really to invite some friends, neighbors, co-workers that uh, maybe don't go to church anywhere. Uh, And maybe they, you know, have some thoughts about God, but maybe they don't have clear thoughts. And anyway, you can just invite them and say, hey, come connect with our church. See that we're not that weird. And they can be a part of it and just have a fun day, and, and we can begin to uh, build a bridge into their lives that way. So that's coming up on the 23rd. One thing that you probably should know is that it takes a volunteer team to make that happen. And, uh, and we need folks that can say, hey, I, I've got some time on that day. You don't have to do the whole time. You can do a, a segment of it and say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give some time and some energy, and I'll man the uh, dunk tank or whatever it may be, and, and just create the opportunity for people to interact with our church, ultimately to interact with Jesus. Uh, and so if you, wanna, if you can and, and want to be a part of that, you can get information on our website it's through the digital bulletin as well. Check that out. Next Sunday is Promotion Sunday for our kids, all right? So as kids are moving into the next grade level or the next age group, they're going to be moving up possibly to a different room in Kids Crossing. So if you've got kids or grandkids in Kids Crossing, you need to know that next Sunday they may be going to a different room depending on where they're at. My kid's going from third grade into fourth grade, and so he's going to be in a different room. And um, we will have staff to help figure that out. Because if you're like me and you come to the door and it's like, if your kid was born between this date and this date, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> right? I, it's like rocket science to me. And so we'll help you figure out if you need some help and do that. But a special note, if you have a fifth grader, starting next Sunday, they're out of Kids Crossing. And they are now um, eligible, they'll be in here, but then they're also eligible to go to Fusion Student Ministry, which will be the highlight of their young life, and, uh, and be a part of that. But notice that, take note of that, next, starting next week, rising sixth graders will be in here on Sunday mornings with us, and we'll treat them special, we'll do some hazing, it'll be great, all right? <laughs> also, speaking of student ministry, we want to mention something that's far on in the distance because it, it, it's important to know now for planning purposes. Next summer, our student ministry is going to be taking a mission trip to, I think it's Merida, Mexico, which is a great little town there. People that need to hear about Jesus and, and our students are going to go uh, to be a part of that. And so it's a year-long process, really, of preparation that starts now of students thinking about, hey, do I want to go? Praying about this, making application to go. Maybe there's some parents that you want to go with your student, and, uh, and there's a whole process for that where are super excited for this and want you to know so you can begin thinking about that, praying about it, planning for it, and talking to David Jackson, who is going to be bringing our message this morning out of Acts chapter 17. I'm excited for us to hear from him this morning, ultimately to hear from Jesus uh, as he speaks uh, God's word with us this morning. So as we prepare our hearts and our minds and get ready to hear from God this morning, let's stand and continue to worship him and to lift his name high. Let's welcome him with our praise this morning. Sing with us.
stop you, eternal King. This is your anthem, a holy noise, a chorus of millions, lifting one voice. Worthy, and who was slain, a power and wealth, wisdom and strength. glad that we have a king who's worthy of our of our praise and our honor and as I was thinking about this next song that we're going to do this week about his goodness it just occurred to me that I just really need to take some time and think about that so I'm going to have you do that this morning as well I want you to take us just a second and just meditate on God's goodness to you what has he done in this past week even to show you that he's good to you, of his faithfulness, of his mercy. So take just a second and do that. Now, some of you may not have been able to think of anything. Uh, maybe your week didn't go the way that you thought it should. Um, but the mere fact that the sun came up this morning, that you're breathing breath into your lungs right now is evidence of his goodness and his faithfulness. So as we sing this next song, will you just, if it, that's the only thing you can cling to, cling to that as we sing of his goodness. Sing that. Oh, 
your mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my will sing of your goodness, of your grace, of your mercy, of the hope that you bring. Because God, we can know you and be known by you. So precious Jesus, I just give you space to speak to our hearts today. In your name, I pray. have a seat. Amen. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good? All right, cool, cool. So my name is David Jackson. As Dave said, I am the student pastor here. So if you're new and you're like, hey, who's the coolest person here? I want to get to be friends with them. I'm a student pastor. That's me, obviously. Um, but seriously, I'm, I'm super excited to, to be able to be with you this morning as we continue in our study of the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 17 this morning, so if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and flip there. We're going to be there in just a moment. But first, I want to take a quick poll, okay? So this is going to require a little bit of crowd engagement, all right? So it's maybe a little bit nerve-wracking for some of you, but 
But real quick, just by show of hands, who's a fan of something, right? Could be a celebrity, could be an athlete, a sports team, a TV show, whatever. But here's the rule. Keep your hands up. Here's the rule. You can't be like my wife who likes the color blue, so she roots for the blue team. That's not a fan, right? That's just someone who, who enjoys being part of it. But I'm talking like a true diehard fanatic, right? Like, who, keep your hands up. Now you gotta, you're going to engage me. What are some things you're a fan of? Yeah, right here. Uh, Tigers, baseball. Tigers baseball, right? And that's, that's in uh, Michigan. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, <laughs> over here, right there. I see a hand back there. Yeah. Rockies baseball. Rockies baseball. Okay. I'm assuming that's also in Michigan, so I'm just going to go with it. Um, let's get a few more. Um, right here. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. All right. Yeah. Let's do it. And then let me get one more. Way over here. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. Okay, so Alabama football. Don't, hey, everybody, listen. Don't hate the center. Hate the sin, okay? Let's, let's give them it. But seriously, security, we, we know what to do, okay? So here's the thing. Um, for me growing up, I was never a fan of, like, of like anything really. Like I didn't care about any TV show or celebrity or, or sports team or athlete. Like I, would, I was casually a fan of a lot of things, but I wasn't really like a true blue like fanatic, except for this one guy. It's this guy right here. Um, so this, this is Peyton Manning. Um, most of you guys probably know this. Peyton Manning is undisputed, without a doubt, there is no conversation, the greatest Papa John sp spokesperson of all time. <laughs> um, and you got to admit, Papa John himself came in second. So that's a pretty... That's a pretty big accolade. But before he was in the pizza game, he also had a fairly successful career in football. And so when I was growing up, I was you know, kind of becoming a kid who like, was getting into sports. And, and I was from Tennessee, so I rooted for the University of Tennessee's Go Vols. And um, Peyton was coming around, so, so I, I, I cheered for him, right? Here's a picture of Peyton uh, in 1996. He's actually throwing a touchdown pass to win against, uh, what do you know, Alabama. That's, that's crazy. And then here's another picture the next year. Um, there's another picture coming up here where he, uh, he's throwing a touchdown pass here to win his uh, against the, the Crimson Tide. And I wanted you to see him in motion because it's hard to see how much speed he has. So here's a quick video. This is the following year, his senior year. He uh, fakes the hand and watch the speed, lightning speed, all the way to the end zone. And, uh, and there's the touchdown winning for the third time against, what do you know, Alabama, right? <laughs> so coincidence, I guess. Um, I was like, I was a diehard fan of Peyton Manning. Like, I, I, I just, I could, even after he left college, he got drafted to, to the divisional rivals of Tennessee. And so once a year, they would always come to Tennessee, and I would go to the stadium in my team's jersey to root against them for the other team because I was that big of a fan of Peyton Manning. Like, still to this day, there are stats in my head that are, are completely useless, but yet I still know them. I can tell you that when he set the passing record for a single season, it was 5,477 yards. I can even tell you some obscure stats. Like in 2003, when he won the MVP, it was actually the only time in history there's been a co-MVP with him and Steve McNair. It goes further than that, though. I know deep, intimate, personal details about his life. I can tell you his wife's name's Ashley. His kids' names are Marshall and Mosley, right? Now, before you think, like, this is kind of getting creepy. <laughs> before that happens, let me just state that it's not creepy because me and Peyton share a very special bond because Peyton Manning and I happen to share the exact same birthday. And so every year, me and Peyton would always exchange birthday cards, and I would write, uh, at the end of every one of my birthday cards, I would write, I love you, Peyton, you're the best. Um, and it's not creepy. Again, you have to understand this bond. And full disclosure, I, I will say that his cards, most of them seem to get lost in the mail. Um, by most of them, I mean all of them. But, um, but I know he's receiving them because it, it mentions them in the restraining order I got. So <laughs> I'm kidding about that last part. Um, Here's the reason why I tell you that story, right? Uh, it, it's kind of funny, right? But I think we all know what it looks like to be fanatical about something. Either we've done it or we've seen it. Well, today in Acts chapter 17, Paul finds himself in a city called Athens. And the people there, say what you will about them, are fanatical about religion and worship. But much like a fan screaming, roll tide, their worship is misguided and misplaced. And that's the last dig at Alabama I'm going to do today. So, before we get there, though, before we get to Athens and these religious fanatics, we need to take a step back and, and recap where we've been so far. So if you recall, several weeks and months ago, we started um, in this kind of second phase of our, our study in the, in the book of Acts, or third phase, I guess, and, uh, and Paul had gone to an area called Galatia on his first missionary journey. Well, he said, hey, let's go back. Let's encourage those churches. Let's check in on them. So he takes a guy named Silas with them. They link up with a guy named Timothy and Luke, and all kinds of stuff are happening. But at some point, God says, hey, I, want you to, I don't want you to just kind of check up. I want you to go further and plant some new churches. 
And so they're called to, to go around Asia Minor. They end up in Macedonia, and they start visiting cities. And, and last week, Mark did a great job walking us through this interaction he found in a city called Philippi. Well, as they leave there, they head on to the next city, and that's where we find them, in a city called Thessalonica, and that's where we begin today in Acts chapter 17, verse 1. It says, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where, the, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went to the synagogue on three Sabbath days. He reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So, if you haven't noticed yet, reading through the book of Acts, Paul has a method. Paul has like this routine he does. He goes into a town, and he's going to go first to the Jews, right? He's going to his people. He goes to the synagogue, and he reasons with them from Scripture, explaining that Jesus is the Christ. Now, just so we're clear, when we all get to heaven, you don't have to call him Mr. Christ because it's not his last name. Christ is just a Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. It's a title, but it carries with it a lot of weight, especially for a Jewish person. He's saying, you know that book we read all the time? You know the scriptures from God? You know all those promises about the Messiah? Jesus is that one. He's the person we've been waiting for. He spills out this message, and as a result, it says that some people accept the message, some people reject the message. But as we've already seen in the book of Acts, sometimes people don't just go as far as to reject the message of the gospel, they go as far as to reject the messenger. And that's what happens in verse 5. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men have caused trouble all over the world, and they now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They, were all, they are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made J Jason and the others post bond, and they let them go. So the Bible says that these people are so jealous that they get a mob and they start a riot just to look for Paul and Silas. And when they can't find him, they get the closest person they can find, and it's the guy who's been hosting them while they're in Thessalonica, a guy named Jason, because he was the host. I think there's a truth, before we move on, right, this isn't our main focus today, but there's a truth I want us to see here, and that's that following Jesus and associating our lives with the gospel message is going to inevitably lead to rejection and persecution. It's inevitable. It's not, it's not a possibility. It's not a high probability. It's inevitable. Now, there's a vein of teaching in today's culture that would say that following Jesus simply means living your best life now, right? You may have heard this, or, or just just claim the prosperity you want God to pour over you, and he's going to give it to you. And here's the thing. I want to admit, it's a very encouraging message. It's warm. It's cuddly. It makes me feel good. The only real flaw with it is it's not factually true. God never promised us any of those things. In fact, Scripture says quite the opposite. Check out what John, uh, Jesus says in John chapter 15. He says, remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teachings, they will obey yours also. Verse 21, check out what he says. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Don't miss the reason Jesus gives for such rejection. He doesn't say, they, they don't tithe enough, and so their hearts are hardened, and that's why they're going to reject you. He doesn't say they don't, they don't go to enough religious services. They don't have enough religious knowledge. They don't know enough religious jargon. That's why they're rejecting you. No, he tells us plainly. He says, the reason that you're going to receive such rejection, such persecution, such poor treatment is simply because they do not know God. We're going to see four biblical truths from Acts chapter 17 that we need to all have um, unlocked in our hearts so that we can truly live in the will of God. And the first one I want us to see this morning is that knowing God is essential to following God. Now, some of you are like, okay, um, we didn't come to the advanced class today, like, uh, duh. But, but hear this for a second. That means that within you and within me, there is nothing, nothing that has the ability to guide or shape our lives in a manner that will please God. There's no answer within yourself. If we don't truly know him, there is nothing within us it's more than just a fanaticism, like, man, I'm really a big fan. I've got a bumper sticker, right? It's more than just, man, I'm going to learn a lot of knowledge. This is something more deep, more personal, more real. 
Jesus says in John 10, he says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. There's a sense of of, of, of cause and effect that it's because of knowing God and him knowing us, that's, that's what gives us the ability to follow him. But this also means something else for us as followers of Christ. It means that we should not expect people in our lives who don't know Christ to act Christ-like. I mean, that would be foolish considering I do know Christ, and I haven't pulled that one off yet. Like every day I look at my life, and I'm like, that's, that's not Christ, not in his fullness, Right? What I mean is if you have a friend or a family member in your life who you probably love deeply and you just want what's best for them, but you can see them living in open rebellion to God and an active disobedience to God and his will, and they don't know God, your task is not to teach your family or your friend how to act more like Christ. Your task is to introduce them to the Christ and trust that in knowing him, the transformative work will begin to happen in their lives just as it happens in ours. Knowing God is essential to following God. And so the Thessalonians, they drive Paul and Silas out of town. And so we pick up and verse 10, they head southwest a little bit to a town called Berea. Verse 10 says, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to a Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did a number of prominent Greek women and Greek men. So again, Paul rolls into a town, and he does what Paul does. He goes straight into the synagogue and begins to proclaim the very message that he was just run out of town for. But the Bereans show us a great example of how we can know God and recognize his voice. Scripture says that they were eager to hear what Paul says. They 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 were eager, but they neither accepted or rejected the messenger, but rather they took the message and they held it up to God's word to see if it measured up, right? right? The Bible is just called the canon of scripture, right? And the the word canon literally means just a measuring stick, right? So it's just saying, hey, I hear what you're saying, Paul. This is what God has already told me. Let me hold what you say up next to what he says and see if it lines up. And this highlights the second biblical truth I want us to see this morning, which is that knowing God is essential to hearing God. Knowing God is essential to hearing God. Verse 12 says, as a result, In other words, because they examined the scripture, because they took what they heard and they didn't make a preconceived idea about it or or make a judgment call, they said, let's see what God has to say about that. The Bereans knew God, and so they knew that his word would provide guidance and discernment. If what Paul was saying lined up with, with scripture and with God's word, that's great. That just means we're hearing more from God. But if it didn't, the Bereans weren't really concerned with that. We don't see them like the Thessalonians. I gotta close my ears. I gotta yell at the top of my lungs because I don't like what you're saying. They said, we're not worried about it, because if what you're saying is false, it's going to come true in time. We're going to see that when we hold it up to God's word. This may seem like a given, but all too often I think believers can be drawn off the path with well intentions because they hear something that they would really like to be true. And then they go to God's word to find justification or permission or whatever you want to call it. And we can't forget that we need God to examine our hearts and speak truth to our hearts, not the other way around. He does not need us to tell him, like, hey, God, your message isn't really culturally relevant in 2022. What if we flip some things? He doesn't need that. Remember, we talked earlier that reflecting Christ means that we should expect the way that the world treats us to reflect Christ as well. And remember that Thessalonian mob that just drove Paul out of town? They're not done yet. Verse 13 When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens, and then they left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join as soon as possible. So again, we see that following Christ is going to mean that you draw some negative attention. It's going to happen. As our society continues to become more and more combative and aggressive towards Christianity and the the gospel message, we need to start doing some work now to prepare our hearts for the kind of persecution that Paul received. In fact, we need to start praying that we would be able to reflect Christ in our lives well enough to earn such treatment. And I know that sounds completely counterintuitive that we want persecution, but if we truly want our lives to reflect Christ, we need to recognize that there are some measuring sticks that will help us realize that, And they're not like how many people friend us on Facebook 
or how many people like our Bible verse that we posted, but it's probably how many people are genuinely persecuting and rejecting you simply because of the gospel message you associate your life with. So Paul leaves town. And this time he's, he's leaving without his traveling companions. He's going into a new city called Athens. And you can probably already guess where Paul's going first, right? The synagogue. Yep. So check out what it says in, in Acts 17, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. And a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Now, remember these people, especially the Epicureans. They're going to become important in just a second, so just put a pin in that. All right? Continuing on, he says, Some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And then they took him and brought him to the meeting place of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know this new teaching that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. And then verse 21 is almost like this parenthetical just note. It says, All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. So we have to understand, just for relevance, Athens was the capital of Greece. It was the capital of the Greek Empire. And even though Greece had since fallen, Athens may not be at its prime, but it was still the hub of philosophy and religion in that day. And they were so enamored with religion and with worshiping gods that when they hear Paul talking about Jesus and the resurrection, they just assume that that's the name of two more gods they got to worship. And so they say, hey, let's bring him to the Areopagus, which is just a place that the Athenians had where they would come and discuss anything and everything, regardless of how pointless, regardless of how meaningless, regardless of how trivial the topic may be. If you need something to compare that to in modern day, it was Twitter. It was just a physical place you went and did Twitter. That's what it was. Um, so if you, if you don't know what the Areopagus is like and you want to experience it, just go on Twitter, you can find that. And so here Paul is about to share the gospel message, except this time to an audience unlike one he had, he had encountered before. Appealing to the God of Torah would mean nothing to these Athenians. And what we have next is recorded of Paul's remark to the Athenians, and they're really revealing about how he was going to share the gospel. Verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens... I see in every way you are very religious. Now, I grew up in the South. Have you ever heard a Southern woman say, bless your heart, right? It's either a compliment or an insult, and you get to decide. And I think that's what Paul's doing here. He's like, okay, I'm going to start off soft, but it doesn't take him long to really start to, to, to come at him with both barrels. He says, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. And so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and that is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times and histories and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So remember those, those, those weird group of people I told you to remember the Epicureans and the Stoics from earlier? So the Epicureans and the Stoics, they were two of the leading um, philosophical schools of thought in that day. And Paul ends here after, after kind of going right for the juggler, right? Like, you guys are worshiping in ignorance. He ends with this really interesting phrase in this passage. He says, some of your own poets have said we are his offspring. He's quoting an Epicurean poet named Epimenides. And the myth, the story, the fable behind Epimenides really colors what Paul was trying to say here. So for just a second, let me tell you the tale. So as it goes, Epimenides was this, this character who lived somewhere in 600 B.C., and, and there's a myth behind how he fell asleep in a cave one time for 70 years but didn't age, and I'm like, you know, I love a nap as much as the next person. But, but eventually, uh, Athens called Epimenides and said, hey, we need you to come here. We're, we're experiencing a terrible plague. And so Epimenides goes, and he says, hey, here's the deal. The gods are mad. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this herd of sheep, we're going to let them loose in the city, they're going to run wild, and whenever they come to rest at an altar of one of our gods, we'll know that that god demands a sacrifice, we'll sacrifice the, the sheep or the lamb or whatever it was, and everybody is going to be good. Well, as it turns out, sheep aren't super smart, and gods that don't exist don't give good directions. 
And so many of the sheep just, just fell asleep or laid down on like someone's doorstep or just random places in the city. And so Epimenides says, no, 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 I know what's happened here. There's gods we don't know about yet. And they're mad. So we're going to build up an altar just put to an unknown god on it. And, and kind of their thought, as crazy as it is, is like when a god comes and he's mad at us, he's like, you're not worshiping me. He'll say, no, no, no. It's right over there. We just didn't know your name. Spell it for us. Come on, I'll chisel it on right now. Let's go. What, is it a Z? That's how they thought this worked. And so Paul uses this story that the Athenians would have been very familiar with. And he says, see that altar, the one that Epimenides told you to build? Well, didn't he say that we are all God's offspring? He found common ground. So like, okay, hang on just a second. Let's, let's see what he's saying here. And then if he hadn't already taken a shot across the bow, he turns the page. Verse 29, therefore, since we're God's offspring, we should not think of the divine being as like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Now, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when we will, he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. Now, you got to keep in mind, Epicurean Stoics, the one thing they had in common is neither one of them believed in afterlife or resurrection or anything like that. So they said, nope, doesn't line up with what I already believe. I'm done with you. But, but others said, we want to hear more on this subject again. And so Paul left the council, and some of the people became followers of Paul um, and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus. This would have been like, he was like the, the, the social influencer on Twitter, right? He was, he was one of the, the, the leading men who would have kind of been in charge. He believes, as did a woman named Demarius and a number of others. So Paul doesn't pull any punches here. He's saying, hey, you guys have worshipped a god in ignorance, and that's not worship. He calls them to repent and believe Jesus. And he says, hey, Jesus proved himself when he was raised from the dead. Doesn't that message sound vaguely familiar? Like, isn't that what John the Baptist said when he came on the scene? Hey, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is coming. Didn't Jesus have that message when he came? Hey, repent and believe because the kingdom of God is here. And now Paul is saying, hey, you need to repent and believe because Jesus has come. He has proven himself. We can't worship God in ignorance anymore because he has given us everything we need. And this brings us to our third biblical truth I want us to see this morning. Knowing God is essential to worshiping God. Knowing God is essential to worshiping God. Now, see, every Sunday we come to this place and we have a time of worship. It's even written on the outside of the, the, the room, I think, it's called the worship center. But the reality is, if you're in this place and you don't know Jesus, at best you can participate in a holy book club and glorified karaoke. But you can't worship a God that you don't know. Now, I get for some of you, you're, that's even a little abrasive. You're like, whoa, whoa, chill out now. But isn't that exactly what Paul just did to the Athenians? In a sense, he's saying, hey, it's pretty nice. But you need to tear all this down, and you just set up a new altar to worship in. But not one made out of your hands, one set up in your heart. And you need to worship the one true God. Not, not a God you don't know, not a God who is far off and distant, but one who is close and personal and wants to know you back. This was not a small ask, by the way. For the Athenians, this would have meant tearing down everything about how life was for them and beginning to build it up again on a new foundation. But then again, Paul wasn't ignorant to what that was going to be like either, was he? For a second, let's zoom out and let's appreciate the transformation we've seen in this guy named Paul over the last several chapters. If you remember back in February, Dave led us through chapter 9, and we saw this amazing, transformative, catalytic experience that Paul has with, with Jesus on the road to Damascus. If you don't remember, Paul is, is heading to a town called Damascus. He's on the road, and he's going there with letter in hand to persecute followers of Christ. And then when, when Jesus, God in flesh, stands before him, his, his response is very telling. Paul simply says, who are you, Lord? Who are you? Let's not forget that Paul is not some guy. Paul says he was the Pharisee of Pharisees which meant that he likely had all, if not most, of the Old Testament memorized by heart. He, he was all about Yahweh. He was all about serving the one true God. He knew all the stats, right? But when he stands before God himself, he says, who are you? This may seem a little basic, right, like, like English class, but here's the thing. When you ask someone, who are you, that's a question you should only ask people if you don't know who they are. You don't ask someone who's your best friend, who are you, because you know them. Turn a few chapters to the right, and that same guy is standing before a crowd of Athenians, 
And he says, hey, you need to throw all this away and come to know the one true God. And God's, in John's gospel, Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Was this going to cost the Athenians something to, to leave behind their old life and believe? Sure. Absolutely. But Paul knew that. Paul knew what it looked like. He knew what it meant to, to leave an old life behind and start from scratch. And he knew it was worth it. And it was essential to eternal life. And that brings us to our final truth I want us to see this morning. Knowing God is essential to eternal life with God. It's essential. Four, four biblical truths about the essentials of knowing God. But I, I want to point something out about the word essential. Essential is not a word that you use because you don't want to say really, 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 really important. Essential means that. It means that that thing cannot be absent lest the essence of what it is changes. The big idea I hope we get is that knowing God is essential to every aspect of your life, to every aspect of my life. If you don't know God, everything you are trying to do is somehow frustrated. And that brings me to a question I want to ask us as we close tonight, today. Is your relationship with Jesus essential to you? Think about that question for a second. Like, really marinate. Don't you like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Really marinate on that. Is your relationship with Jesus essential to you? Here's what I mean. This is a waffle maker. I stole this from my wife's kitchen three weeks ago in preparation for this message and left it in my office. She never asked for it. She never looked for it. In fact, I don't think she knew it was missing until first service when she saw me bring it up here. <laughs> now, we own it. It's ours. It's part of our life. But is it essential? I don't think so. Now, if I had a coffee maker with me this morning I took three weeks ago, that would have been words. Trust me, it's, it's a little bit of essential around our house. If I could somehow take your relationship with Jesus away, and praise be to God, I can't and neither can anybody else. But for the sake of this question, if I could, if it somehow went away, would it matter? Now, keep in mind, you still got church. You still got the place where you can come to have social connections. You still have a place you can come to bring your kids and teach them good morals and values. But the relationship with Jesus was stripped away from your life. How, how fundamental, how essential would that actually rock your world? Would it be like I took your waffle maker? Would it be like you got home and found out your coffee maker was gone? Or would it be like you got home and found out your home had vanished? The very place where you run to for shelter and security and hope, it was just gone. And if you're asking yourself that question, you're like, well, what would be different? I guess not a whole lot. I'm just being real. Maybe that's a red flag that you need to stop. You need to really do some heart work this morning before you leave this place. Jesus says in Matthew Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? These weren't people that just tried to do good things. They did good things in the name of Jesus. And Jesus' response is one of the most frightening things you could ever imagine hearing from the Savior of the world. He says, then I will tell them plainly, yeah, but I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. As we began this morning, I told you about a fanatical obsession I had with Peyton Manning growing up. But for all the stats, for all the information, for all the birthday cards that definitely weren't creepy, if I were to somehow in one of those games rush the field and juke and stiff arm the 200 security guards looking to take me out, and I got to him and I said, Peyton, it's me, it's David, I'm your biggest fan, bro. I know all your stats, the co-MVP thing, I wrote you the birthday cards, I always say I love you, but it's not creepy. I'd like to think that Peyton would say, man, well, cool, I'm super honored. Really, I mean, obviously a tremendous fan. I'm humbled by that. The birthday cards, yeah, they're super sweet. Somewhere when you turned like 23, they got creepy, but it's okay. But, but for all that, here's the thing, bro. I don't know you. We don't know each other. Like, just because you know stats about me, you think you know me? How many people are in a church this morning, all across the world, singing songs to, following a moral code for, reading a book about, tithing to, sacrificing to, offering genuine devotion in the name of a God that they do not know. That's, that's worthless. I pray if that's you in this place right now, you, you hear these next words very carefully. All that can change in a singular moment. 
It's not something you have to grab a hold of and pull yourself up. No, the act of surrendering to Christ is just letting go of that bar altogether and saying, I can't do it, but I want to know the one who can. If you don't know what that looks like, we're going to have a time response in a minute. Maybe you just need to grab someone around you who you, you believe does know and say, hey, let's go outside. We've got we to pray. I need you to help me with some stuff. But for those of you that have already made that decision to follow Jesus, I need you to hear that, that following Jesus and knowing G- God is not an event. It is a journey that lasts a lifetime. Paul says in Ephesians, he says, I keep on asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. So you might know God, but to know an infinite God is, is just impossible. But we can know more about him today. So if you feel like you're giving every bit of your effort, but still finding obedience to God is just so elusive, maybe you need to stop relying on your own strength. And you need to come to know God better. Are you struggling to hear God's direction or, 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 or discernment in your life? Maybe you need to come to know God more intimately. Do you feel like in this place your heart is so hardened that it's incapable of truly worshiping? Perhaps you need to reintroduce your heart to the one who formed it. And yeah, maybe you feel that you walk into this place this morning spiritually dead inside. Maybe, maybe it's time for you to have the creator of this universe breathe the breath of life into your spirit and come to know the God who gives all life. Wherever you're at this morning, you need to know God more today. You need it. It's essential. We've included some resources in the digital bulletin. I encourage you to check those out. But more importantly than anything, right now we all need to run to the arms of the Father of mercy and grace and just rest in his presence. As scripture says, just be still and know that he is God. So we're going to sing a song in a few moments, but this is not for us and it's not for you either. It's for him. It's a time to know him. So maybe you need to stand to your feet and sing at the top of your lungs the expression of love for this God. Maybe you need to bow your heads and just in the quietness of your own soul, just weep and confess to him. Maybe you need to grab someone and get out of this room and say, hey, I've got to talk. I've got to get some stuff off my chest. Whatever it is, the next few moments we reserve, we give as a sacrifice to the one true God. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. We thank you that while we were far from you, desperately broken, you knew us even then. And you wouldn't allow us to remain lost. You came to this place. You walked among us. And you helped us by giving us your word that we could take with us, that we could study, that we could meditate on, and we could come to know you more. And so, God, right now in this place, whatever walls we built up in our hearts that we brought into this place, God, I ask that you would come and in your power that you would shake those walls and you would crumble them to the ground. Whatever, whatever fear, whatever doubt, whatever trepidation we have about just letting go and saying, no, I'm going all in for Jesus. I want to know you more. God, that you would just help reassure our hearts right now that you would invade this place. Every, every corner of this room would be filled with your Holy Spirit and every, every corner of our heart would be invaded by your Spirit. God, let us praise you and be glorified in this praise. And we give you all praise in Christ's name. Amen.
your heart. So have a great week. We'll see you next week. Have a great one. There'll be people at the door that can uh, take your tithes and your offerings. There'll be folks in the back that can pray with you if that's needed. Hope to see you next week. See